I need no flesh while the world standing, lest I make my brother to a thing. Thank you, be seated, please. As I look at this chapter, I see three things that come to my mind. They are, number one, what is conscience? Number two, what is an idol? And number three, under what circumstances should a believer curtail his Christian liberty? We'll look at these in order. What is conscience? The Greek word is synodesis. And it is a monitor with which we have discernment between right and wrong. Conscience is a moral awareness that something is not right with us. It does not appear in the Old Testament, but it is expressed by the word heart. David said, my heart smote me. That was conscience. It is a gift from God. It is innate, that is, it's in all persons. It is found 30 times in the New Testament alone. It causes remorse after a person has sinned. It is a guardian of morality, justice, and decency. It is a faculty which discerns between right and wrong. It can only be perfected through the death of Christ and His atoning blood. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9, the Old Testament sacrifices that were offered even though they were of blood over and over again, which could never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Then in Hebrews 9, verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So it's a purging conscience. It is found one time in the Gospel of John, two times in the book of Acts, three times in the book of Romans, nine times in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 13, two times in 1 Corinthians, four times in 1 Timothy, one time in 2 Timothy, one time in Titus, five times in Hebrews, and three times in 1 Peter. So you can see from those listings that it's in the Gospel of John, it's in Romans, Corinthians, Timothy, Titus, Hebrews, Peter, and so on. God just about puts it everywhere. It's an important faculty of you of who you are. Now there are many different aspects of conscience. As I prepared this message, I just sat down and thought about how many different kinds of conscience there are. And there are many. I'll give you a rundown through those. Now the Apostle Paul was answering questions for the Corinthian church. Certain problems had arisen in the church that needed answers. So Paul picks up his pen and he writes this book of 1 Corinthians as a corrective to the church at Corinth. They were in bad condition spiritually. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They were going to law with brothers. They were visiting prostitutes in the temple. There's not much of anything they weren't doing wrong. The church was in sad condition. 
And so Paul writes to them, and one of the main things, the reason I'm preaching on conscience, is because they were eating meats which had been offered to idols. Now, in those days, the Jews, of course, would not eat the meat, but Gentiles were eating it, and some Jews may have even eaten it. But at any rate, the food that was offered to an idol was then sold in the shambles, that is, in the city. And if you wanted to buy good meat at a cheap price, you would go buy the meat that had been offered to an idol. Now, of course, that would offend the conscience of a true Christian. And uh, it presented a problem in the church. There were brothers who had a weak conscience who couldn't eat the meat that had been offered to idols. There were strong brothers who knew they were saved by grace, who knew their sins were forgiven, who knew that there was nothing to that about eating meat. They knew that they could eat meat without reprobation. And so it was about to divide the church into two camps. So Paul had to write and straighten out, is it okay for a Christian to eat meat which has been offered to an idol? And it was all clustered around the word conscience. Conscience was the watchword for all of that. Because the moment they ate the meat which was offered to an idol, conscience began to speak to them. Conscience began to rebuke them. Conscience began to upset them. And they knew they were in trouble with the Lord because in their weak conscience, they were not aware of the fact that they were at liberty to eat whatever they wanted. That knowledge was not theirs. In fact, he even begins this epistle with the fact that some have knowledge. And those that have the knowledge of grace know that they can eat meat no matter where it came from. But those that were with the weak conscience just couldn't do it. They just didn't dare do it. So now we come to look at the different kinds of conscience. I sat down in my study the other night and I listed the ones that came to my mind and then I got my concordance and found some more. First of all, there is a good conscience. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 12. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no meat while the world standeth, that lest I make my brother to offend. So he speaks here of a good conscience. Again, in 1 Peter 3.16, Peter writes, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, he as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ, having a good conscience. Again, Peter speaks in verse 21 of chapter 3, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us figuratively, pictorially, but not actually not putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, Peter is saying here that the resurrection of Christ and the reception of Christ as our personal Savior is the answer of a good conscience. It doesn't give the good conscience, but it's the answer of a good conscience. And today when we observe the ordinance of baptism, that is giving a good answer 
to a good conscience. Then in Acts 23, in verse 1, the Apostle Paul speaks to it. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. In other words, a conscience void of offense. Then in Acts 24, verse 16, Paul writes, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a good conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now that's a good conscience. It has no offense toward God or men. It's a good thing to be able to walk through this world and to be able to say, I have a good conscience. My conscience is not accusing me. My conscience is still. It is clear. I have a good conscience. That's what we all need, a good conscience. Then there is such a thing as a pure conscience. 1 Timothy 3.9 Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. A pure conscience. Holding the faith in a pure conscience. And then again, Titus 1.15 speaks of a pure conscience. Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now when a person is in that condition, he's in danger. He needs to look out. The mind and the conscience both defile. That word defile is the Greek word moluno, and it demotes to be smeared as with mud or filth, to be fouled. It is used in the figurative sense of a conscience defiled by sin. You see, maluno means that as if someone would take a handful of dirty mud and throw it in your face. And it would hang on your face. Maluna. And that's an individual that by his mind and conscience has been defiled. In other words, his garments are not spotless. We sing that old hymn sometimes about the spots in our garments. I expect we all have a few spots in our garments. We need to get rid of them we need to make sure there are no spots in our garments. We need to have pure garments. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. White is the color of purity symbol of purity. There were a few. Did you notice that? Just a few. A few names in Sardis that had not defiled their garments. You know, we need to make that our daily prayer. Lord, help us to walk through this world and keep our garments unspotted from the world. First, Corinthians 8, 7 speaks of believers who have kept themselves and their garments from the pile. There are a few, but not many. Then there's another word applied to the conscience, and that is the word seer. Seer. 1 Timothy 4, 2. Speaking of the unsaved, false teachers. It says, speaking lies, these are liars, in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, they've been cauterized in their conscience. They're insensible 
to feeling about consciousness. A person like that is a person who's on his way to hell. He has no conscience of his sins. They don't bother him at all. And when these murderers and rapists and evil people are brought before a judge, quite often many of them will say, I have no conscience about it. I don't have any trouble with it. I just did what I felt like doing. They are, they have a seared conscience. They'll never be saved. They'll never trust the Lord. They'll never darken the doorway of the church because their conscience has been seared and they have no faculty to discern between right and wrong. They just, they don't. Well, I'll just pause a moment and say the entire Democratic Party <laughs> is an example of that very thing. They even put a sign up and said at one of their conventions, we do not want God in our platform. That's what happens to their mind. Right. Their minds are seared with a hot iron. They don't want God. They even publicly say they don't want God in their platform. Well, I could say something else, but I think I best not. First Timothy 1.19 says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Now, that's a picture of a ship sailing over the ocean and it runs into some rocks that it didn't know about and rips the hull out of the boat and the ship goes down. Goes beneath, beneath the waves and disappears forever. Those who do not have a good conscience have made shipwreck of their life. Perhaps they even once professed faith in Christ, but now they have a seared conscience and they've made shipwreck of the faith. And they'll just tell you, they don't believe the Bible, they don't believe in God, they don't believe anything. They've made shipwreck of their faith through a seared conscience. And then there is a witnessing conscience. Conscience will witness to you if you're not beyond redemption. Witnessing to you. Listen to Romans 2.15 as conscience bears witness. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. This is universal in people. Everybody comes into this world with a conscience. And unless they defile it and dirty it and get their garments spotted, they're in bad shape. Nine, Romans 9, 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Paul says, my conscience bears witness to my faith in God. He had the witness of the Holy Spirit. What is the witness of the Holy Spirit? It's the Word of God in a believer witnessing the Scriptures to the deity and the blood of Christ. Then we have an example in John chapter 8 and verse 9, there was a woman taken in the act of adultery and they caught her and a group of men brought her to Jesus, threw her down at Jesus' feet and said, Master, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her what sayest thou? Here this poor woman cringing on her face on the ground. Those men standing around jeering and laughing. 
and they try to pit Jesus against the law of Moses. If he goes with the law of Moses, then he's going to have to command they stone her to death. But if he does offer the mercy of forgiveness, then they will go back and report him to the Pharisees that he's against the law of Moses, so we have to stone Jesus. So they thought they had him in a dilemma. They thought they had Jesus trapped. But you know what Jesus did? He stooped down, took his finger, and he wrote in the dust of the ground. Nobody knows what he wrote. Nobody knows, unless he's a first year seminary student. But people do not know what Jesus wrote. But whatever he wrote had an effect on their conscience. And one by one, they turned and went away. Why? Because when he wrote in the ground, whatever it was, and I had a suspicion that he was writing their names down, they were guilty of the very same thing they were wanting to stone her to death for. Conscience bears witness. Romans 9, 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. John 8, 9, convict, and they, when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. You'll notice the eldest went out. First, Jesus was left alone. Now we come to the subject of idols. verse 3 through 6. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, that there is none other God but one. Only one God. For though there be many that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be God's many and Lord's many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. By Him we have our absolute eternal salvation. I go to Psalms 115 to see what an idol is. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. That's the sovereignty of God. He will do whatever he pleases to do. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Conscience. 
The idol is nothing. That's what Paul says about the idol. <clears throat> In chapter 8 and verse 4, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. And though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we by Him. An idol is nothing. It's plaster Paris. It's wood. It has no life. It cannot speak. It cannot hear. It cannot know. It cannot answer prayer. It is not alive. It is not real. There's no reality in an idol. And yet millions of people worship idols all over the world. An idol is a zero without the rim. Nothing. Nada. How people can worship an idol is beyond me. Even as an unsaved man, I never worshiped idols. I, I can't understand people worshiping an idol. It can't speak, it can't hear, it can't talk, it can't do anything. An idol is an idol. It's a nothing. It's a nothing. And why do men come to worship idols? Romans 1.21 gives the answer. Because that when they knew God, or of God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The penalty for worshiping an idol is to have your mind darkened. That's what it says here. Their foolish heart was darkened. And then in Romans 1.22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Take, for instance, all the philosophers. Their minds are darkened. They deny the Lord God. Then in Romans 1.23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. In other words, they have made man over into their own image. This is why people hate God today, because they want a God that they've manufactured in their own minds. They have invented their own God. And their God is not the God that created the universe. Their God is not the God that gives forgiveness of sin. Their God is not the God that washes sin away. Their God is not the God that can save and keep His people and their garments. Made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things, in some nations, they worship the alligator. In some nations, they worship animals of various kinds. In some nations, they worship various things. But none of it for the living God. What is an idol? It's anything you love more than God. Mm. If there's anything, family, wife, mother, friend, if there's anything that you love more than God, that's an idol to you. And you know what? God quite often will take that idol away from you because He will not share His love with you unless He wants to give it to you. You can make an idol out of your automobile. 
there was a time that I idolized automobiles. I had to have a new automobile every year. I even went into the automobile business because I wanted to be around automobiles. I loved automobiles. But the night the Lord saved me, I realized that was idolatry. Mm. The Lord saved me. I quit the car business, got out of it. And to me now, it's nothing but just a, a means of getting somewhere. It doesn't matter to me what kind of a car I have. My God is in the heavens. I worship Him. Amen. Not an idol. Adam and Eve, fresh from the hands of the Creator, just brought into being out of nothing, out of the dust of the earth. And it wasn't long before Satan slipped over and slyly suggested to Eve that God was withholding something from them. God wants you to, uh, Satan wants you to know that God is keeping you from things that you might like to enjoy. God is selfish. He's keeping everything Satan says to himself. Now, if you would just taste this piece of fruit on this tree, you would be like God. You would have the knowledge God has. Why don't you help yourself? God doesn't have any authority over you. You can do what you please. It won't hurt. It won't matter. Go ahead. Taste it. And she did. And when she did, you know what happened to her? She died. Oh, she didn't die that day. It was a long time later. But she died. And she gave it to her husband, and he died. And then they had children, and they were still born, spiritually speaking. They came into this world dead in trespasses and in sins through Adam's sin. And the sin of Adam was the sin of the human race because Adam was the head of the human race. When Adam sinned, God passed a sentence of judgment upon the entire human race. So you and I were born into this world sinful. We sinned by choice. We sinned by nature. We are double-dyed sinners. And that's why we have a bad conscience sometimes. We are sinners. But thank God when salvation reaches us, He gives us a good conscience. Amen. He washes the garments. He cleanses the heart. He makes the heart acceptable to Himself and gives a good conscience. Then the third thing I'd like to mention is the fact that we Christians, we have liberty. I can eat any kind of meat I want to. It's okay. My dear friend Jacob Gartenhouse, the Jewish missionary, said one day he went to a farm to hold a meeting, and he preached a meeting for the farm, and uh, he was back home, and he was telling his Jewish friends about his meeting. And they asked him what he ate. He said, well, I ate bacon and ham. Oh, they said, Jacob, you can't eat bacon and ham and go to heaven? He said, yes, you can. You can eat bacon and ham and go to heaven a whole lot quicker. So you ought to watch what you eat. <laughs> but we have liberty. We can eat any kind of meat we want to. There's nothing wrong with eating meat, which the Bible says was created by God with thanksgiving. Verse 9, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee sit at knowledge, 
and meet in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge, because you know you can do it and you do it, shall thy weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, Paul says, if me make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Here is a weak brother. And he's walking down the street passing the temple. And he sees the strong brother, who is a member of his own church, eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And he thinks about that. My strong brother is really a good Christian. He's really strong. He's one of the best Christians in the church. But what's he doing eating this meat that's been offered to idols? That's not right. How can he do that? And he goes home and just thinking about it. He says, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe it wouldn't hurt if I took a little meat. After all, it is cheaper and it is a good cut of meat. I think I'll give it a try. The Bible says he's emboldened to follow the example of his brother who is strong. Now it doesn't hurt that strong brother any at all to eat that meat. But what does hurt is that weak brother. That weak brother is now regularly, daily eating meat offered to I. Then he goes from offering, eating meat offered to idols. He goes to other things that are even worse. You know what happens? The Bible says he perishes. Mm. Now, we need to know what that means. It does not mean he's going to lose his soul. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not perish, did you get that? But have everlasting life. Now the brother that fell, the weak brother, by following the example of the strong brother, he perishes how? Physically. Physically. You say, what about 1 Corinthians 8 and 11? It says the weak brother will perish that refers to physical dying, not spiritual dying. John 3.16 tells us we cannot die spiritually. If we're born again, if we're washed in the blood, we cannot die spiritually. But we can die physically. And sin brings death, oftentimes, to those who continue to sin. But I can show you from the use of other scriptures that this is not talking about losing your soul. This weak brother didn't lose his soul. For example, Matthew 8, 25. Lord, save us. We perish. They were about to drown in the boat. We perish in the sea. Matthew 9, 17. The wine runs out. The bottles perish. Then in Matthew 26, 52. He who takes the sword shall perish with the sword. Then Luke 13, 33, a prophet cannot perish outside of Jerusalem. Luke 15, 17, the prodigal son was perishing with hunger. And then Luke 21, the hair of the head perishing. And then John 11, 50, the nation of Jerusalem perishing. Then Acts 8, 20, thy money perish. 2 Corinthians 4.16 Though our outward man perish. Hebrews 1, 10 and 11 The heavens and the earth shall perish. All of these scriptures that I just read, every one of them had the word perish in it. And not a single one of them 
had anything to do with spiritual death. It had to do with physical death. Now, in closing, the confusion. The church was being led to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols, which they could have done if their conscience had been strong. But their conscience wasn't strong, and so they couldn't do it. And so Paul writes to them, and he tells them to be careful about their eating. You can become a stumbling block to your weak brother. You may do something that is not morally wrong, but it may cause a weak brother to feel that he can't do it. And so Paul says, if you sin against your weak brother, you sin against Christ. Because that weak brother is in Christ. Like Jesus said, if you go to a harlot, you unite Christ to that harlot. You can't do that. So his conclusion was in verse 13 of chapter 8. He says this, If what I eat is going to make another Christian sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to make another Christian stumble. We need to be careful what we do, what we eat, what we see, where we go. Hebrews 10, 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And that's not speaking of baptism. It's speaking of the cleansing of the heart. Washed with pure water. That's a symbol of the Old Testament washings. Washed with pure water. That's the internal cleansing by the blood of Christ. So, today men worship the stars. They worship the planets and their solar systems. And they call the solar systems by other gods. Mercury, Venus, Mars, all named after gods. And the cults are known for forbidding meat. A good way to identify a cult is to ask them if they believe it's all right to eat meat. Mm. If they say no, then like Spurgeon says, get you gone. <laughs> Don't hang around a minute. Get you gone. So we need to be careful that the church we belong to is a church of pure conscience. We'll close be dismissed in prayer then I'd like to ask you to remain for a few moments and we'll prepare for the baptismal service. Father, we pray that you would bless and use your word today. Give us a clean conscience. Give us a good conscience. Keep our conscience clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism 
him unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection be. At this time now we'll have the baptism service. All right, this is grace. And grace, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Therefore, my sister, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised again unto the newness of life. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, dear Mr. Smith.